Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to Maniac Grip. Today we're going to take a look at my top 10 instructional art books for all artists. The books I'll be talking about today are specifically educational with text, chapters, explanations, and sometimes step-by-step -step process. I've decided to separate the personal art books or art of books for a different time. We live in such an incredible time to learn pretty much anything that you could ever want to know. And while I love the massive access to videos on YouTube or online classes or online tutorials or mentorships available to artists these days, I still think that there's a wealth of information that you can learn from good old fashioned books. Voldemort learned about Horcruxes from the restricted section. And one of the things I really want to preach is that knowledge comes from anywhere. Good ideas can come from anywhere. It could be written on a napkin and be like the most profound thing you've ever heard. Number one, Artistic Anatomy by Dr. Paul Riche. This book was originally published in French in 1889, and it is widely acknowledged as one of the greatest works of its kind. I'm kicking off the list with this book because it remains some of the most anatomically accurate plates in existence. Someone once asked, like, how did these old guys learn anatomy so well, like back in the day? And the reason is because they went to the source. They actually had cadavers. They had bodies to dissect and really look at the real musculature. And the closer that you can get to the true source of knowledge, the more accurate it's likely to be. So what do I love about this book? It has incredibly clear drawings and it has rotations. Like you can see what the arms look like from different angles or the legs. It really has the solution to every viewpoint. And what's great about this book is that it concerns itself with artistic anatomy, which is to say superficial anatomy, you know? We're not medical people. We're only dealing with things that affect surface form because as artists, that's really what we're concerned with. I'll be straight up honest, I've never actually read the text, any of the text. I only ever looked at the drawings for this book, but still there's so much to glean. And this really sets the bar for anatomy books. But do keep in mind this book is strictly focused on anatomy and it doesn't worry too much about like structure or like imagining the, the legs like a cylinder or something like that. So it is really just about anatomy. Number two, Vilpu Drawing Manual by Glenn Vilpu. Originally published in 1997, this is probably one of the heaviest hitters on this list. This book would have changed my life if I knew about it earlier. When you're a new artist, you're thinking that good art is representational art, which is to say, like, you want it to look exactly like it looks like in real life. You know, you get your fruits in your little glass bowl and you try and paint it and you shade in the reflection. You're like, wow, look, it looks real. But what you actually don't have are any tools. You don't have any real knowledge. You're purely, you know, doing hand-eye coordination to get that drawing down, which is, which is cool, which is what you have to do. But this book is a great introduction to gesture and structure and construction and form and negative space and all the tools that you need, especially when you're capturing something complex like the human body, all these tools that can help you get that drawing down on paper and fit within your page. What I like about it is that it starts so simply with just treating the head as a, you know, like a sphere with a little line to indicate the neck. And then you kind of build from there. You start building the rib cage, then the pelvis. It starts teaching you about overlapping lines and creating depth in your drawing. And one of the things I really like about this book, and actually it calls itself a manual, which it kind of feels more like that because it's spiral bound and the drawings feel relatable. Like the drawings in it look like something that you could do. You know, you can do yourself at home. The lines are kind of sketchy as opposed to these like super clean Photoshop drawings that people often put in books that you feel like it's almost unobtainable. This one really kind of builds up slowly. The rough work is there for you to see and appreciate. So it feels kind of comfortable learning with this book as opposed to a lot of the stuff that is out there. So overall, this is a fantastic book. I highly recommend this for anyone. It may be a little bit more rare these days, maybe a little bit expensive, but it is worth every penny, especially if you're just starting out. This is really the one I think you should start with. Number three, Figure Sculpting by Philippe and Cherise Ferro. So this book is really meant for sculptors, but more and more I realize that 2D and 3D are more similar than they are different. 3D is ultimately presented in a 2D graphic image, and 2D artists should always be thinking about forms no different than a sculptor. So Philippe Fro's instruction should be relevant and helpful to all artists because he's very good at simplifying the forms of the body and showing you how the planes of the body, the structure of the body, is really the foundation, and all the detail, all like the skin wrinkles and all that stuff, is really just a layer that acts upon that really good solid foundation. Now I can think of several books and resources that simplify the body into planes no different than this but there's something special and simple about the way that he breaks the body down into blocks and cylinders and spheres that is even better than some of those other artists because he really sticks to the primary forms uh, without going too crazy in some of the detail and i might kind of bring this up later in the video when i mention a different book at the end and just a special comment for the 3d artists out there this book is so solid for like let's say you're working in zbrush you start with these basic forms and you can create a hand or a foot and it is 
gold. This, this book is literally gold for sculpting those forms from scratch. Now this book is part of a series of book. Actually, this is book three. The others deal with portraiture, more to do with the face, uh, doing different ages, genders, races, as well as another book dealing with cloth. And all of them are great, but I think this one is great for just capturing the whole body as opposed to just the face. I think it has the most information and it is applicable to all artists. Number four, Stonehouse Anatomy by Seok Jung Hyun, who also goes by the nickname Stonehouse. This book was published by Super Annie, which is the creative studio that the late Kim Jung Ji was a big part of. And straight up, this book is a masterpiece. It's probably one of the most exhaustive anatomy books ever released, period. It is beautifully illustrated. I cannot emphasize how well done the art in this book is. The thoroughness of the depiction of the muscles, the skeleton, as well as the sheer volume of illustrations in this book. It's like, you can kind of get a sense in some books where the artist kind of burned out. You know, they, they start filling it in with some sketches or like, you know, filler filler stuff there is no filler in this book it is all solid painting and drawing and very similarly to Kim Jong Ji who was known to just draw endlessly you know fill entire murals and walls of art without reference non-stop just went for it this book kind of harnesses that same vibe that it's effortless to draw the body a thousand times over from any perspective it exudes this confidence and mastery of drawing the human form because of just how many drawings there are in this book it's it's unheard of one of the unique features of this book is that it tries to explain the mechanics of the anatomy like why the body created these features these bones the patella the ligaments why it, it works the way it works through a series of little comics throughout the entire book on one hand, I really love having those side notes to help understand, you know, not just what things look like, but also why they look like that. But at the same time, sometimes it does kind of clutter the book a little bit. Like the book is a slow read. I'm still working through it. So it kind of does feel very dense. Like there's no fluff in the book. It just feels very heavy. But what the little side comics succeed at doing is help defang the scariness and seriousness of anatomy that you're used to seeing. Anatomy is a really intimidating thing to learn, especially for newer artists. And it can be kind of sterile and boring and what's all these Latin words? What are these names? But this book really helps to make it palatable for people to digest. And not just that, the author attempts to make it fun and playful. And one of the things that kind of makes it stand out is that it's digitally painted. So I'm not used to seeing anatomy books with digital painting. That's a very modern look. And so it's kind of nice to have things that you normally see in like black and white ink drawings brought to life a little bit with Photoshop. But if you only can afford one anatomy book, and it is an expensive book, it's this one. Number five, Perspective for Comic Book Artists by David Chelsea. All right, moving beyond the human body now, at some point you're gonna need to draw some backgrounds or some objects, and you're gonna need to know perspective. Originally published in 1997, this book is very unique in that it tries to teach you perspective through a comic book. So it uses perspective to teach you perspective. It's kind of putting its money directly where its mouth is. And I think this book is a pretty friendly gateway to introduce perspective to you. So it reads just like a graphic novel. You don't feel like you're reading an instruction manual, although at times you may need to take some breaks because it does get a little complicated. But David Chelsea, the author of the book, puts himself as a character in the book and tries to assure you that it's not as hard as you think. You can do this, you can learn perspective. And here are the rules. So the book does its best to try and make it easy and like it holds your hand through every kind of perspective, one point, two point, three point. Talks about horizon line. There's a couple of tips. Probably the biggest tip that I myself never kind of forgot from this book was things that are on the horizon line will be equal across multiple characters so like let's say the horizon line hits the belly button no matter how close or far the figure is from the camera that horizon line because there's no perspective on the horizon line will be at the same spot on each human body that blew my mind when i first read that i will say the comic book format is interesting and it's cool but it may not be like the most direct method of teaching you the various forms of perspective um you probably could get away with doing less and just kind of getting straight to the point but i still recommend it i still think it's worth at least a read number six how to render the fundamentals of light shadow and reflectivity by scott robertson and thomas bertling Published in 2014, this book is probably the closest you can get to attending Art Center's famous industrial design or transportation design program without actually attending it. For a long time now, Art Center has been regarded as probably one of the most hardcore schools you can go to learn how to do art. But when it comes to industrial design, it's not just art, it's really science. In fact, the degree that you get from the transportation design program is a Bachelor of Science. And so what they learn is really about manufacturing, designing, you know, actual objects that people will use. And so they have to be practical, they have to be based in reality, they have to be presented to a very high quality standard. 
But anyway, as far as the art aspect, you can trust that these guys know what they're doing. Their drawings are very technical and very accurate and very beautiful. And a lot of their alumni have gone on to work in the film industry to work on huge projects that you guys all know. People like Sid Mead, Ralph McQuarrie, Ryan Church, Craig Mullins. So there must be something in the water over there at Art Center. And Scott Robertson has really had an amazing career of education trying to teach students all of these concepts that they practice, exercises, drawing, rendering. And so this book, How to Render, which is actually part of a series of books, the other one being How to Draw, captures the skills and standards required for conceptual draftsmanship. One of the things that I really like about this approach to art is that because it is kind of more scientific it really deals with how you would technically solve you know where does the shadow fall or you know the perspective of an object or how it curves around as opposed to the kind of more expressive side like this approach is much more calculated and probably the biggest nugget of information that i got from this book that i personally love was the one two three read which means that in order to create the illusion of a three-dimensional object, you really want that one, two, three read on the three different sides of the object. And then on top of that was the discussion of how you approach the one, two, three read. If the base color, then the local color of the object is, let, let's say a white versus a gray versus a dark object, you have to know how you're gonna approach the one, two, three read in those cases. So that section in particular was like a eureka moment for me and pretty simple, but profound. And it really changes how you look at things. So the only other thing I'll say is that this book is probably more for the intermediate artist. I don't know if it's the best for like a very, very beginner, but I'm not discouraging you if you are a beginner to pick this up and go ahead and get started. I myself need to go through this and still need to apply it uh, again, like years after I got the book. So if I had actually practiced what this book had told me, read it, researched it, practiced it over the last 10 years, I'd probably be very good. So yeah, this book has lessons that are timeless. Number seven, Color and Light by James Gurney. Published in 2010, this is probably one of the best overall introductions to painting and color and light. I almost didn't include this one on my list simply because a lot of the YouTube videos I saw already mentions it, but it really does deserve its spot as being a great introduction to painting for people of all skill levels. So it covers like a wide range of different topics, actual painting techniques, but really it's about the theories and the ideas of different light sources. You know, you've got exterior lighting, interior lighting, natural light, artificial light, talking about color gamut. And so, so far we've talked about the human body We've talked about line work, technical stuff. We did a little bit of rendering in the previous book, but this book kind of is an introduction to color and that is the next step for you. And the best part about it is when you're dealing with the theories, it doesn't matter what medium you're using. You could be using watercolor or crayons or markers. The theories are the same. It applies to all of them. You're dealing with value, hue, saturation, and you're dealing with color harmony. You're dealing with the exact same things regardless of what actual thing you're holding in your hand. It's all about being aware of those concepts so that you, the artist, can communicate exactly what you want to to your viewers. It's also worth mentioning that James Gurney just seems like a nice guy. I don't know, his voice just comes through in a very positive way in the writing of the book but then you can follow him online he's had a presence uh, on the internet for a long time trying to help educate painters and he seems like a very generous person also another art center alumni number eight graphic la by rob rubble published in 2014 this book is a completely different approach to everything we've talked about so far and i've included it on this list because even though it's more of a personal sketchbook for rob rubble it's like his collection of work embedded throughout the book are little lessons and guiding principles that he believes in and he follows and he believes makes good pictures so it's not intended to be like a traditional art training book but it is no less valuable in teaching you lessons that are very important so his approach is less to do with the kind of stuff we've looked at you know like the line work perspective and all that it's more to do with shapes, value, shape, and rhythm. So maybe you're not great at line work and maybe you can't do perspective and all that stuff, but you can probably boil things down to basic shapes and that's what he does best. Just for some context, Rob Ruppel was an art director and visual development person on Spider-Verse. And I actually had a whole section dedicated to his work on Spider-Verse in my part four, where I depicted how Rob starts with a very simple block out and then just builds on that to create something that looks very complex, sophisticated, and detailed while still obeying the organization, the hierarchy that he's established with his basic shapes, with his basic values. So this book will really push you to see simplicity and build on that. And all of those tools will help you make stronger compositions. And that's what he's emphasizing is to see things in a more simple way, organize it, and then depict it. So Rob Ruppel really is one of the best visual development artists that I know of in the animation field. And this book is just a great departure from all the technical stuff, which can be very tedious. This one is actually a lot more fun. It's simple, it's accessible to newer artists. and it's one of those things that it's really simple to learn, but difficult to master. And even though it has minimal text, the points hit really hard. This method is the perfect counterweight to all the other stuff that may block you, bog you down as an artist. 
pick this one up. This one will be really appealing to a lot of people. Number nine, The Art of Color by Johannes Eaton. Published in 1961, this book can best be described as an exploration of the chemistry and reactivity of color. It's an in-depth study of how color works and the different properties that the artist can take advantage of when it comes to color. The book is really cool because it really is just color swatches being compared to each other. There are a few paintings that are used as examples of the color in action. The bulk of the book explores what is known as the seven color contrasts. Those being hue, light dark, cold warm, complementary, simultaneous, saturation, and extension. You guys probably know what most of those are, except for maybe simultaneous and extension, which is pretty neat. Simultaneous is a human sensation, it can't be photographed, where your eye, when presented with a very strong color, automatically seeks the complementary color. So in this example, there's a gray square surrounded by an orange field, and your eye will naturally want to make that gray field look a little bit blue, just because it's looking for that complementary color. So it kind of just goes to show you that colors are greatly affected by the surrounding colors around it, and the artist needs to be aware of that to use that to their advantage. The other one that you may not have heard of is extension, and extension is the physical size of a color and keeping those in balance. So in this example, we have rectangles of two colors, and the idea here is that these colors are now in balance, but look at the proportions. So for example, the purple is a lot bigger than the yellow, but that is because the yellow is so vibrant and so strong. So there needs to be a disproportionate amount of purple to balance the yellow. So this book is all about color relationships and essentially that's color theory. So this book pairs really nicely with the one I mentioned before, Color and Light, because it's kind of like higher level and it just deals with swatches. You're not looking at like a thousand paintings. It's really just trying to show you the properties of color by itself. And it may not be a book that you appreciate as much when you're younger, but as you kind of get more advanced, you start to really look for the knowledge that is in this book. Now, I almost feel like this one's unfair to put in my list because I looked it up and it's really hard to come by now. And if you do, it's very expensive. So you may not actually be able to obtain this one. Maybe there's a PDF somewhere, but this book is fantastic. So it does deserve to be on the list. Maybe I'll just have to lend you my copy. All right, so I've got one more book on this list and it's really hard to pick one because there are so many to choose from. And I was really torn between these two, sort of, but I'm going to go with number 10, Drawing the Head by William Mon. This book was published in 2004, and back when I was a student, I think I picked it up just because I liked the art in it. I thought the portraits were really good. This book is about the technique of chiaroscuro and using it for portraiture. Is this the best portraiture book in the world? I don't know. But I think this book is very good at gently introducing the artist to the idea of light, shadow, and form. And it's really good to have a book that dives into the human face, you know, covers all the features of the nose, the eyes, the mouth, the planes of the head, all the forms of the facial features, because that is where your audience is going to be looking at for most of the time, is the face. This book is kind of similar to the one by Nathan Fox called How to Draw Portraits in Charcoal. And I would put both of these books on the same tier, except I think Drawing the Head is a little bit more of a textbook and is a little bit more general in its approach as opposed to Nathan Fox's book, which is very much his personal style. Nathan Fox is incredible at capturing a sense of light, but I I find his book has a little bit more of a very personal take and if you draw kind of like him it'll be like hey you're just copying Nathan Fox. So I do think drawing the head may be better for a broader more general audience. Okay okay last thing we're going to talk about are just some honorable mentions. Obviously some books that I have to mention but you know didn't make it to my top list. Books like Andrew Loomis I could have mentioned because I think that is foundational but those books are so ubiquitous in the art community that it's everywhere like people don't even own that book because the PDF circulated to pretty much everybody back in like the early 2000s so I don't have that copy of the book but I have the PDF so I'm not going to mention those ones but those probably are some of the best books on art for foundation but they're just everywhere so you know definitely check that out. The books that I want to talk about that I've always kind of had this weird like love-hate relationship with are the Bern Hogarth series. So Bern Hogarth obviously master artist the guy can draw he's got some really fantastic shapes beautiful line work beautiful form but i don't actually recommend them for newer artists today i think that his style overall is very dated and even though he does focus on structure you know you know he does a really good job of describing the primary forms of the body i feel like an artist who is starting out might actually confuse that and become too rigid and i find burn hogarth stuff a little too cumbersome like when I look at the dynamic wrinkles and drapery book, it's just a little bit too much. 
We don't really draw like that. Even though he's trying to teach theory, I even struggle sometimes to extract the theory from his books because the lines are just so crazy. I really don't want to put down any art books. I think they all offer something. But I'm just trying to say, take those books with a grain of salt. I think they offer some really great information, but some of it is a little bit too heavy, a little bit out of date. And even just the writing, I find a little bit too stuffy. But some of the things that I can say are excellent. I do think Drawing the Human Head is a great book by Bern Hogarth. Honorable mention number one, Anatomy for Sculptors by Uli Zarens. This book was published in 2018 and it is probably the go-to book for most 3D artists for anatomy. Those of you who are already familiar with this book may wonder like why isn't this in your top 10? Because to be honest, it really does deserve to be in my top 10. The reason is because I felt that the Philippe Ferro recommendation was a little bit different than what people normally hear. Plus, I actually still stand by what I said at the beginning of the video. I do think Philippe Ferro's uh, method of simplifying the planes of the body is more digestible and accessible than the ones in Anatomy for Sculptors. And that's not to say that Anatomy for Sculptors doesn't have an excellent way of breaking down the planes of the body. But I almost think that Anatomy for Sculptors doesn't simplify enough. It's more like if you're familiar with 3D terminology, Philippe Ferro's method is almost like teaching you subdivision level one. And Anatomy for Sculptors is more of a subdivision too, which means that you get more into like the secondary forms. So it is really good at teaching you the planes, but it's almost too much. I don't want to play it down. It's a fantastic reference. It also doesn't have much writing in it. It's almost purely visual. Part of the series is also the Anatomy of Facial Expressions. I think that one is excellent as well. Those two together really stand on their own. So they definitely deserve to be on a list. Uh, I just didn't have room for it, but that is why it's my number one honorable mention. Honorable mention number two is Force by Michael D. Mattesi or Matesi. This book is actually one of the few explorations of what I would call like animation style life drawing where the emphasis is really on gesture and movement and force. And I think it's a really important lesson for all artists, especially newer artists, to understand that you want to create a sense of weight in your drawings. So this book was like one of the first that actually captured the animation school experience and how the kind of life drawings you're going to end up doing. So I highly recommend this book, but at the same time, there's something holding me back from putting it as one of my top 10. I think the reason I can't put it in my top 10 is simply because of the amount of times I've referred to it. I haven't actually gone back and read it more than maybe once. If I was to be critical of it, I would say maybe it's because I don't love some of the drawings that are in it. I think the cover image is probably the strongest image in the whole book. There's a lot of student art contribution and you know that can be kind of cool like oh hey these are what my students did and let me correct you and show you how to do it instead. That doesn't really work for me as well. I just want to see like the good drawings. I just remember there being kind of like a weird feeling that I got from reading this book that I just it didn't quite speak to me. However, I do think it's really important to understand and again emphasize gesture 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 you really like you can have gesture in a lamp you can have gesture in something that is a very static inanimate object and if you've seen my spider-verse videos i talked about straights versus curves I think it's really important to have a book that teaches you that kind of animation style of straights versus curves, the kind of Disney principles. You do need a book somewhere, whether it's this one or another, that teaches you about those ideas. So now I don't want to say if a style is right or wrong, but the one thing I'll caution with this animation style of drawing, which I'm guilty of, I have personal experience with this, is that it's very easy to get comfortable with that animation look and you never actually break into naturalism or realism. You never get nice organic lines or details or veins because you're like, oh yeah, I'm all about force and weight and simplicity. There are other forms of art and just be mindful that you could get stuck in that trap of only doing the animation stuff. I remember a line that really stayed with me. It was by Marko Djurjevic from Six More Vodka. Um, I see a lot of people who are, uh, especially coming from the life drawing side of art that are uh, really energetic in their strokes and they're uh, really forceful when they're trying to apply lines and uh, they're very concerned about blocking their proportions right and everything. Um, it's one approach but it makes your drawing very generic and it kind of bleeds into your final designs and um, one of the things I, I, I really cannot stress enough is like taking your time for your lines and uh, really go in with the flow and uh, trying to use um, every shake of your hand to create small interruptions within within your lines to make them more organic and more realistic because if you for example look at um, at your own hands or your arms you'll see they're they're not straight curves they're not forced lines like it is um, it is uh, uh, drawn a lot within life drawings there there are way more bumps for example there's way more iterations in in the forms and this is kind of a newer book that came out at the start of 2022 by Hukaru Hayashi 
called Drawing the Female Figure. This one is very good if you're into the kind of anime style of things. I myself don't draw like that, but I picked this up because I do kind of want to learn how to draw like that. Seeing as how popular it is, I assume that most of you guys would dig this. Kind of related to what we've been talking about, I just saw a post yesterday by Chris Doe on The Future where he says, it's not how much you read, it's what you can recall. It's not how much you can recall, it's what you're able to apply. Therefore, read with the intention to apply. And I actually think that's a great quote because lately I've been finding exactly that. I immediately discard the stuff I know I'm not going to want to keep in my, you know, my daily work. And the stuff that like the points that I really need to work on or whatever, I really try to remember those and then I apply it immediately to my work. And it actually works. If you, if you deliberately try to read with the intention of applying it to your work, it's one of the best ways to absorb books. So that's it, guys. Thanks for watching my top list of books. I hope that helped. I hope I had a few in there that were a little bit different than what people may have mentioned. Let me know what you think about my list. And also feel free to recommend me other books. I'm always looking to add more to the collection and learn something new. And on a side note, I actually just really enjoyed talking about these art books. I come from a different era than I think a lot of the digital artists nowadays. I love books in general, but I love art books a lot. And I think I'll I'll probably do this again in the future. So thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.